Good afternoon, people. My name is Bruce Elliott, and uh, even though I retired from the Department of History in July, I've been asked to come back and to do the introductions today. Uh, when I retired in July, that made me an emeritus professor. I've always rather liked Stephen Leacock's definition of emeritus, E for out and emeritus for deservedly so. <laughs> but uh, I have come, come back uh, with great pleasure because I've been involved with the Shannon Lecture Series for many years. And um, I've been asked, therefore, to welcome you to Carleton University, to the Department of History, and to the 18th Annual Shannon Lectures in History, our Fall Public Lecture Series. This year's theme is uh, historical biography, uh, individual and collective. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we're gathered is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. And the final lecture of this year's series, uh, looking ahead to April, uh, November 29th, if any of you have your calendars filled in that far, uh, deals with using electronic media to share the life of an Indigenous elder from one of the British Columbia First Nations, one that uh, many of us are looking forward to a great deal. Now, the Shannon Lectures in History are a series of thematically linked public lectures offered by the Department of History each autumn and made possible through the Shannon Funds, a major gift from a long time and long anonymous friend of the Department of History. And following the passing of our benefactor and a close personal friend of mine in 2017, we were permitted to announce at long last that the Shannon Funds were donated by Lois M. Long in memory of her parents, James Buchanan Long and Ida Mae Davidson. Now, Lois Long grew up on a dairy farm in Nepean, a descendant of early, early Irish settlers. Following a career as a medical laboratory technologist that took her to the Canadian North, as well as to work in Ottawa, she traveled extensively. She explored long-standing interests in photography, local and family history, Western migration, and the historical links between Ireland and Canada. In 1998, Lois donated her collection of Inuit sculpture, collected during her travels in the Arctic to the Carleton University Art Gallery, as a longtime supporter of local and local history and heritage, she also approached Carleton University about establishing an endowment fund to support the study of her areas of interest, Canadian social immigration and local history within our department. Peter Fitzgerald, who was then department chair, had organized a public lecture series in 1998 on the subject of the First World War, with most of the speakers being members of the department. And it was Peter's idea that the income from the new Shannon Endowment be employed in part to make a public lecture series an annual event, each year with a different theme related somehow to Canadian social history. But the terms of reference encourage us to recruit some of our speakers from across North America and around the world, speakers who could demonstrate the linkages between approaches to Canadian history and the wider body of international scholarship. The first Shannon Lecture Series in History, funded by the Shannon Endowment, took place in the autumn of 2002, organized by Marilyn Barber and myself on a theme that was of special interest to our donor, Immigration and Identity. We're fortunate to have some co-sponsors for our lecture today, and we're acknowledging with gratitude the contributions of the Department of English Language and Literature, the School of Indigenous and Canadian Studies, and the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. It is now my pleasant task to introduce our first speaker of the season and the organizer of this series, Charlotte Gray. When our past chair, Dominic Marshall, suggested the theme of historical biography, I could think of no one more appropriate as an organizer for the series. Charlotte Gray is one of Canada's best known biographers and writers of popular history, as well as an adjunct research professor in the department. Born in Sheffield and a graduate of Oxford University and the London School of Economics, Charlotte came to Canada in 1978. She worked as a political commentator, book reviewer, and magazine columnist before she turned to biography and popular history. She holds five honorary degrees and is a member of the Order of Canada and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Her previous award-winning bestsellers include The Massey Murder, Reluctant Genius, Alexander Graham Bell and the Passion for Invention, and Gold Diggers, Striking, striking It Rich in the Klondike. Gold Diggers was the basis of both a U.S. Discovery Channel documentary and a, PBS, a docudrama and a PBS documentary. 
Several of her books are biographies of Canadian women. I think, for example, of her biography of uh, Isabel King, the mother of Prime Minister King and the daughter of the Upper Canadian rebel William Lyon Mackenzie, and the link between those two very different personalities. Sisters in the Wilderness, about the Strickland Sisters, which Charlotte published in 1999, was named one of the 25 most influential Canadian books of the past 25 years by the Literary Review of Canada, and it was made into a CBC docudrama. Her 11th book uh, brings back the gold mining theme and uh, a masculine focus, Murdered Midas, a millionaire, his gold mine, and a strange death on an island paradise about which she will be speaking today was published last month. Her ability to provide original and intriguing entry points into Canadian history has earned Charlotte a large and faithful readership and regular request to appear on television and radio. And so it is with the greatest of pleasure that I turn the podium over to another longtime friend of the department, Charlotte Craig. Thank you, Bruce, for a very, very nice introduction. And thank you all for coming this afternoon, one of the last warmish, sunny afternoons of uh, the late summer. So I regard this as a great gen gesture of confidence. And, um, I also wanted to just actually remind you that this lecture is being recorded and both my lecture and the question and answers afterwards will be live streamed. So if you want to ask a question but do not want to be live streamed, let me know. And lastly, hashtag, I know you're all on your devices already, <laughs> hashtag Sh Shannon's, it's up there, Shannon's 2019, um, start now. <laughs> I'm honored to be the organizer of this year's Shannon uh, lecture series, both um, because it's a very distinguished series and also because it's a, a something that I can do at Carleton University. I'm really proud to be an adjunct professor here, adjunct research professor, but I have to admit, I always get this sort of twinge of imposter syndrome when I'm at, li at literary events and I'm introduced as, a, uh, prof as Professor Gray because, um, I write, but I don't teach, and I don't go to meetings. So I feel that I'm uh, being an adjunct is just the best of all worlds. Writing books is my day job. Of the 11 books I've written, six have been fairly straightforward historical biographies and the kind of biographies that we're discussing in this series. Because this fall, we're going to be not, we're not going to be talking about breathless biographies of soccer stars, singers, and other Instagram celebrities, or instant biographies of today's rising or falling political stars. We're talking about historical biographies, biographies of those on whom, for the most part, the dust has settled. And I recognize that the title of this series, The Shannon Lectures, Rebooting Biography, is itself a bit of a presumptuous title, because the biograph biographical genre has never been static. It, the art, and it is an art, of capturing a life on a page has evolved constantly over the years in both style and substance. However, when we tried to capture in that, what we tried to capture in that title was the idea that there are new pressures on the biographical form. Thanks to Wikipedia and other online encyclopedias, all the facts of a life are available today at a reader's fingertips. So we want, what we wanted to do in this series of lectures is to explore new approaches to biography. There are plenty of authors, both scholars and non-academics, still writing the traditional cradle to grave tomes that have fueled the bio biography industry for centuries and that make the online biographical dictionaries look skimpy and probably unreliable. These biographies are meaty and important, and I know that most of you have several on your shelves. They're usually read in hard copy, though you may get lumbago carrying around some of them, such as the new biography of Gandhi by Ramachandra Guha, for example, which clocks in at over a thousand pages. But all the speakers in this series of lectures have brought fresh approaches to the genre. They have variously disinterred the marginal and forgotten from the past, contested their subjects' conscious or unconscious ideologies, 
and adapted the biographical genre to cultures that rarely celebrate the individual. Today I'm going to talk about experimenting with biographical forms to explore both an individual and a historical event. Our next speaker, Cecil Foster, will discuss how he wrote a collective biography in order to bring into the foreground a group which had been nameless and largely invisible during their own lifetimes and had no hope of appearing in Wikipedia. Dr. Constance Backhouse will speak about the interplay between a biograph biographer's feminism and the attitudes of her subjects, the first two women appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada. Then we have Dr. Maya Jasanoff from Harvard, explaining how she recontextualized the 19th century novelist Joseph Conrad in order to see his life through a global lens, a very contemporary lens. And in our final lecture, Dr. Paige Raymon from UBC and Davis McKenzie will talk about the groundbreaking digital book they created along with Slavon elder Elsie Paul and Elsie's granddaughter to reveal indigenous life experiences. Each of these writers has changed the angle of vision within the traditional biographical genre. Their work reveals perspectives and insights that you could never find in Wikipedia. Before I turn to my recent book, Murdered Midas, I'd like to make a few general remarks about biography. Historical biography has always been regarded with wary skepticism in academic circles. Since the rise of Marxist history, the trend in university history departments is towards an interest in structures and big systems. What is the value of the individual when set against the economy? As a biographer, I'd like to think we've reached the high watermark of the assumption that human beings are just flotsam and jetsam on the tide of events. However, that's not altogether obvious when I look at much of the output of university presses. Even biographers who come from within the academy know the curled lip of condescension when their departmental colleagues hear they are focusing on an individual rather than a faceless argument. I also recognize that some of those reasons for the long-standing academic distaste for biography. Academic skepticism swells, for example, when a biographer is captured by his or her subject. When the subject of a biography is accorded all the credit for a particular triumph, with no discussion of others involved, we can all wince. Michael J. McGandy, a senior editor at Cornell University Press, wrote recently, quote, when I read Kristen Downey's biography, The Woman Behind the New Deal, The Life and Legacy of Frances Perkins, I came away with a sense that Perkins had single-handedly orchestrated the New Deal and that Franklin D. Roosevelt had nothing to do with it. <laughs> similarly, similarly, it's hard to exaggerate the impact of Winston Churchill, but it is still possible to distort the facts in order to burnish the halo of a national icon. In his recent and exhaustive biography of Churchill, for example, Biographer Andrew Roberts exonerates his subject from all responsibility for the Bengal famine of 1943 to 1944, an exoneration that no Indian historian would be prepared to accept, and not many in Britain either. Professor Guha, for example, Gandhi's biographer, is scathing about Churchill's decisions. There is also the problem that a good biography requires an abundance of sources, and too often the only people who have bequeathed an archival El Dorado to their biographers, papers, diaries, memoirs, are prominent individuals of European extract. The wealth of sources underpin the kind of hardcover, meaty biographies that I mentioned earlier, and I acknowledge their importance, but they do tend to be about dead white men, and they tend to reinforce the great man or woman perspective on the past. Please understand, I'm by no means dismissing such scholarly endeavors, although I do wish some of them paid as much attention to literary quality as to footnotes. A recent example of an impressive new biography that does not focus on a dead white man is absorb and is absorbing to read is the biography of Frederick Douglass by David Blight, which recently won the Pulitzer Prize for History. Blight decided to write a biography of the former slave 
who became America's leading abolitionist of the 19th century because a trove of new archival material was offered to him. And yes, this is another brick, 900 pages. And yes, Dr. Blight is professor of American history at Yale University, and it follows, his book follows the conventional cradle to grave narrative. But Blight also, Blight also acknowledges the larger import of both his biographer's subject and the significance of the direct human interaction between two individuals, his subject and the reader. As he writes in his introduction, how Americans react to Douglas's gaze, indeed how we gaze back at his visage, and more important, how we read him, appropriate him, or engage his legacies, informs how we use our past to determine, to determine who we are. The potential of biography to create both an intellectual and a human link between present and past has rarely been best, better expressed. There is one particular academic reservation about biographical form that does make me bristle. This is the notion that most historical biographies are simply too popular and accessible, too close to entertainment. <laughs> As a writer of popular history, I try very hard to entice people to buy and read my books, but it's not simply because I want to sell books. I also want readers to absorb a glimpse of a larger Canadian history. And now, more than ever, Canadian history as a subject of popular debate, as well as an academic discipline, needs all the help it can get. Recent debates about the role of Sir John A. Macdonald played in this country, about the role that Sir John A. Macdonald played in this country and its history should have been a golden opportunity to explore with our fellow citizens how the past is a different country, how historical legacies should be evaluated, how each generation rewrites the national narrative. Instead, the Macdonald debates have illustrated the sketchy, sketchy grasp of history held by some participants. Because so many Canadians learn almost no his Canadian history in school or college, they have not been taught the critical thinking that arguments about Macdonald's legacy require. Instead, some participants in the debate filter it exclusively through the identity politics that currently dominate much of our public discourse. We all need to make a concerted effort to address a broader public about both the facts and the importance of history. A well-written biography can address that challenge. That obligation was certainly in my mind when I decided four years ago to write a biography of Harry Oakes. I'd already experimented with different approaches to biography in previous books. My earliest efforts, as Bruce mentioned, were fairly straightforward, cradle to grave treatments of people who I found interesting and who had left sufficiently large archival resources for me to work with. The common thread of these early efforts was that they were all women, women who'd often been ignored in the macho nat national narrative embraced in Canada in the mid to late 20th century. My subjects included those sturdy pioneer sisters, Susanna Moody and Catherine Parr Trail, and the Mohawk poet, Pauline Johnson, Teda Wanoada. These biographies were well received and sold well, but I was taken aback when readers confided, I hated history in school, but thanks to your books, I'm really starting to enjoy reading about Canada's Britain, Canada's past. I grew up in Britain, where history has always provided popular themes and personalities for creative fiction and nonfiction writers. Just think about the wild success Hilary Mantel has enjoyed with her erudite but compelling novels about the rise of Thomas Cromwell at the Tudor court and the making of a new kind of England. Wolf Hall was recently named in The Guardian as the best book of the 21st century. And the third in Mantel's trilogy, which is going to be published next year, is widely expected to be an even bigger hit than Margaret Atwood's Testaments. <laughs> My next two books took a different approach. I'd become absorbed in the challenge of telling the larger Canadian story, a dangerous word, I know, story, to a readership that seemed oddly averse to the past. I wondered how to intrigue readers by approaching history from unexpected angles. My first approach was through letters, and I published a book of 200 letters from a wide range of people, 
written between 1800 and 2000. I wrote a linking narrative, fitting each letter into the wider context of the times, but readers encountered the letter writers' voices unfiltered. And I discovered that readers loved those direct encounters with primary sources. I went from letters to artifacts, working with the brilliant cultural entrepreneur, Sarah Angel, who today heads up the Art Canada Institute. I wrote about particular objects in a volume called The Museum Called Canada. The biography of the northern half of North America was told through essays on a series of objects such as a Norse pin found at Lanceau Meadows, or General James Wolfe's copy of Gray's Elegy, or a First World War ga gas mask, or the UFO landing pad built in Alberta in 1967 to celebrate Canada's centennial year. I had not realized there was so much imagination at work then. Next, I tried the group biography Gold Diggers, striking it rich on the Klondike, in which I interwove the stories of six individuals who participated in the Yukon Gold Rush of the 1890s. The books did well, but all this time, I heard the growing murmur of readers confessing to their ignorance of, if not aversion, to Canadian history. I saw physical evidence of it too, in the placement of Canadian history in bookstores. Books about our collective past were drifting to the back of the stores. Meanwhile, what was claiming the bookstore windows and front of store di displays? Crime, murder, Scandi noir, lengthy accounts of mass killers, detective novels. I decided to try a cr true crime frame for my next plunge into social history. This was the Massey murder, a maid, her master, and the trial that shocked a country a 2013 bestseller. I discovered that an account of a domestic drama in Toronto in 1915 made an excellent entry point into an exploration of a city and society on the cusp of change during the First World War. When young recruits were being shipped off to the killing fields of Europe, women were de demanding the vote, and the great dominion of the North was beginning to shake off its colonial mindset. And it helped that the story had a contemporary resonance. The maid had shot and killed her, employ her employer, a member of the Massey family, because he'd sexually harassed her. The book's publication coincided with the explosion of the Me Too movement. So I've experimented with various approaches to biography, and I've expanded my personal take on bio biography to writing biographies of groups, events, and art artifacts, as well as to individuals. Which brings me to my latest book, Another Expedition into True Crime Territory. But first, I wanted to share with you the explanation of why I decided to write this book. A few years ago, a friend of mine who teaches at the Schulich School of Business at York University said, OK, Charlotte, so you've done poets and pioneers and political mothers. But what about economic history? When are you going to write a serious book, a business book? a book that talks about the men and industries that made Canada the wealthy country that it is today. I was a little stunned. As someone who's always focused particularly on women and on social and political history, told in the most accessible possible style, I had no idea how to grapple with a business story in a way that I would enjoy, let alone my readers. But I was actually flattered by his in interest, and I thought about what he said. And I was reminded of the disgruntled reaction to my Klondike Gold Rush book on the part of some Northern Ontario mining to experts. The Klondike Gold Rush, a couple pointed out, was minimal in terms of its total out output. All it had going for it was a lot of starry-eyed writers who had dramatized it for their own gain. Writers like Jack, L Jack London, Robert Service, Pierre Burton, me, <laughs> what about the Northern Ontario gold rush? Stan Sudol of the Sudbury Star had asked. At its peak, the Klondike gold rush only lasted for a few years, 1896 to 1899, and produced a miserly 12.5 million ounces of gold. Chump change, according to Mr. Sudol, who then went on to compare Northern Ontario's gold rush of the first half of the 20th century, which produced at least 10 times as much gold. Thanks to the Ontario Gold Rush, 
By 1930, Ontario had become the world's second largest producer of gold, and Toronto was well on its way to becoming the global center of the mining industry. Ontario's mining industry had helped the province survive the dreadful depression of the 1930s that devastated the prairie, pro prairie provinces. Why, my Northern Ontario friends inquired, had nobody written about that? And then I recalled the story of Harry Oakes, who had discovered a seam of gold at Kirkland Lake in 1912, managed the unique accomplishment of developing and retaining ownership of his own private gold mine, and become tagged in the newspaper as the richest man in the British Empire. Harry Oakes, who had been created a baronet for various acts of philanthropy, Oakes, who had left Canada, where he'd made a fortune on the Canadian Shield, and decamped to the Bahamas to escape Canadian taxes. If you've heard of Sir Harry Oakes, this is probably all you know about him. This photo was taken on July the 8th, 1943 in Nassau, capital of the Bahamas. It's a police scene of the crime shot. Earlier that day, Sir Harry Oakes, by now the largest landowner in the Bahamas, had been found bludgeoned to death in his own bedroom. If you have heard of Sir Harry, you also probably know that his murder was never solved, and I'm going to get to that. But the sensational story of the murder had always fascinated me, and I knew it would attract a wide readership. However, I was also interested in how he got so rich. And I realized I could satisfy my curiosity and my friendly business historian by taking a much deeper plunge into Harry Oakes' life and death than had hitherto been undertaken. So let me now embark on the biography of Harry Oakes, framed within the true crime genre, and how I used it to illustrate two larger themes. The early chapters bring to life an episode in Canadian economic history by telling the story of that Ontario gold rush and its impact on Toronto and Canada. The final chapters take a look, a look at a completely different phenomenon, but one that particularly resonates today, the distortion of facts to fit a particular narrative. Even as a boy growing up in Maine, Harry Oakes was mesmerized by gold, and it's a pretty mesmerizing substance. It's harder to find than almost any other metal. Harry Oakes' prospecting had begun in the Yukon in the mid 1890s, and he would spend 15 years chasing his dream before he arrived in Ontario. But the, the, Ontario, the Yukon gold rush was different. The Yukon gold rush was about placer mining, sifting the gravel of northern rivers and mountain streams to find nuggets and flakes of gold. Anyone with a pair of rubber boots and a gold pan could do it. The major challenge was making the journey of thousands of kilometers to get there and then surviving the bitter cold. The largest investment required was the cost of traveling so far north and supporting yourself miles from anywhere for, through a whole winter. The Ontario gold rush was about hard rock mining, which requires massive capital investment, a much tougher proposition than the place of gold mining that triggered the Yukon gold rush. When the gold is locked deep inside the iron hard Canadian Shield, as it is in Northern Ontario, it requires heavy investment in equipment and infrastructure. And a gold producer has to drill down and dig up about 20 tons of ore for enough gold to make a wedding ring. That's like finding a grain of salt in a jumbo bag of Doritos. Few of the ragged ass prospectors who actually discovered gold bearing rocks in Ontario in the early 20th century ever made more than a few hundred bucks from their strikes. They had no access to the capital required to develop them, to take core samples, pay for them to be assayed, and if there was sufficient gold content, to start serious drilling. So they usually sold their claims to financiers and corporations and hucksters who would go on to make massive profits if the claims were good or if they could just find another buyer. But Kenny Harry Oakes, who could barely afford decent pants, got rich because not only did he strike gold, he managed almost single-handedly to develop his mine, which he lame, named Lakeshore. It became one of the most productive gold mines this country has ever seen. The catalyst 
for the great Ontario gold rush was this, the steel rails of the Tomogamy and Northern Ontario Railway. This railroad opened up the hitherto impenetrable Canadian Shield country in the early 20th century. The dense bush north of Lake Nipissing was a pretty bleak landscape for the settlers it was originally built to attract. And the railway surveyors paid no attention to the rights of the indigenous peoples whose lands they were grabbing. Local Ojibwa bands found their traditional way of life disrupted by the sound of locomotive steam whistles and the mighty crash of felled trees. Life for them would only get worse as their resources were ransacked. There are still no land agreements between the Ontario government and the indigenous peoples in this area. The latter have never been compensated for the land grab in Northern Ontario. And it's part of what underlay, underlies the debate today about developing the Ring of Fire region. But some people were going to get lucky. The railway surveyors and builders stumbled on gleaming mi mineral deposits as they cleared the rail route. And news of their finds quickly attracted prospectors. These were tough, tough men, prepared to sleep under canvas through the winter in order to stake out a claim and start digging. The payoff could be huge. The first big strike was the 1905 silver strike at a tiny mining camp called Cobalt. Within months, Cobalt had 16 mines operating and was a raucous boom town. It's a shadow of its former self now. There are still a few people scratching away um, at the uh, resources there, but it still has this amazing sense of sort of um, confidence and they love their town song. The first two lines of which are, there's a great little town called Cobalt. If you don't know it, that's your fault. <laughs> Cobalt was only the start. As the railroad forged north, prospectors followed the tracks and struck gold. And Harry Oakes, who'd now spent 15 years looking for gold all over the world, joined the stampede. He made his way to a tiny community called Swastika. So this is in 1911. When Hitler came to power and Swastika became the most hated symbol in the world outside Germany, they were Put, the town was put under tremendous pressure to rename itself Winston, but the local merchant was outraged by this and printed a whole lot of matchbox covers which were t were on which was printed, Hitler be damned, this is our name since 1922. Oakes had heard that some existing claims at a nearby lake were about to become available at midnight in January 1912, and he reckoned they had potential. So on a bitterly cold night, minus 52 Fahrenheit by some accounts, Harry and two pals, the Tough Brothers, trudged through nine kilometers of the drift, snow drifts on snowshoes by the light of the moon to Kirkland Lake. They restaked those claims before any rivals appeared. He and the Tufts then managed to scrape, scrape together the money required to start developing the first of several lucrative mines. I'm not going to go through all the financial gymnastics that Harry went through to develop his own mine, Lakeshore. They did, however, leave him with a lifelong distrust of promoters and wheeler dealers. And for example, he always refused to entrust his fortune with any large Bay Street firm. Instead, throughout his life, he left his considerable Canadian holdings, which actually includes some of the most valuable property in Niagara Falls, with Welland Securities on the Niagara Peninsula. And he was never an easy companion. His reputation for truculence and boorish behavior was justified. A fellow prospector wrote of him, he never stopped. The memory we had of him was of a little guy, broke, his bare ass sticking out of his pants because he couldn't afford to buy any more, always working, always alone. Nevertheless, he would redeem himself to Kirkland Lake with some generous donations to the community, including that all important symbol of Northern Ontario, a hockey rink. But his efforts and his success in raising the funds to develop the mine on his own paid off. Within a few years, he employed a sizable crew. And in this picture, he is on the far, my far right, uh, sitting on the, um, you can see him sitting on the veranda. And the two gentlemen wearing white are the camp, camp cooks. And by the mid-1920s, Lakeshore was a substantial undertaking. 
That mine was a freight train of an earner. In the 12 months ending mid-1925, it produced gold bars worth $1.8 million back then, when gold was worth $20.67 an ounce. Today, with gold worth around $1,500 an ounce, that's the equivalent of $130.5 million, and a lot more when inflation is taken into account. <clears throat> By mid-1931, its annual out output had risen to 664 million in today's value, and Harry's personal take each week was the equivalent of close to half a million a week. No wonder that Lakeshore was the darling of the Toronto Stock Exchange, and the Toronto Stock Exchange became the exchange for mining shares. So Harry could afford the good life. He built himself a fine mansion in Kirkland Lake. He actually began taking a few trips. On one trip, he met a pretty Australian woman, half his age and a foot taller than him, called Eunice McIntyre. Within weeks, they were married. But the town of Kirkland Lake was not really the ideal place for the multi-millionaire to raise a family. It was a blue collar company town in which 90% of the population was male and brothels and bars proliferated. Oak's fortune was built on the sweated labor of men who faced daily dangers underground with no protective equipment or safety standards. And there remained a lot of resentment of Harry Oakes, despite his philanthropy, because of the seven gold mines strung through the town. Conditions at, because of the seven gold mines strung through the town, conditions at Lakeshore were regarded as the worst. Lakeshore shafts ran deep under the lake and were constantly threatened by rock slides and flooding. In the 1930s, a newly arrived miner named Alan Collier wrote to his fiancee that the Oaks mine was, quote, too darn dangerous for the likes of me. At that mine, a human life has the value of a piece of machinery. They are such a powerful outfit that they can get away with flagrant breaches of the Mining Act. Anyway, the Oaks family left Kirkland Lake, although Harry returned regularly to keep an eye on his mine. First, he settled in Niagara Falls, where he bought and renovated a splendid stone mansion. And they, all together, he and Eunice would have five children, two girls, three boys. He was still a short-tempered bear of a man, but he and Eunice became prominent local benefactors. They donated trophies for sports competitions, land for sports facilities, and an open-air amphitheater and garden near the famous falls. But you know, there's a thing about the super rich. They really hate paying taxes. Every time I read about the Panama Papers, I think this is nothing new. Harry Oakes really resented paying taxes on the wealth, even though it was acquired from Canadian rocks. And at the start of the 1930s, he was lured to Nassau, the capital of the British colony of the Bahamas, by a smooth-talking real estate agent named Harold Christie. Nine-tenths of the Bahamians were black and extremely poor, but island politics and trade were dominated by a clique of white merchant families, known as the Bay Street Boys, who ran the place to suit their own interests. And as Harold Christie was eager to explain to Harry Oakes, any expats who lived there could arrange their affairs in a way to avoid any income tax. This prospect was irresistible to Harry Oakes. Life got better and better for Harry Oakes. With Christie's help, he bought nearly a third of New Providence, the island on which Nassau is situated, and articles appeared in Canadian newspapers about his lavish lifestyle. Harry Oakes acquired property in England too, and made more strategic philanthropic gifts. His friends and the gifts helped Harry secure a baronetcy in King George VI, 1939 birthday honors list. The headline in London's Daily Mirror, I was thrilled to find in the archives, read, quote, pick shovel man is sir. <laughs> Back in Nassau, there was a new governor of the British colony, the Duke of Windsor, the former King Edward VIII. Privately, the Duke and the Duchess described the Bahamas as, quote, a ghastly backwater. They were very big fish in a very small pond, 
They had been exiled here by the British government because they had fascist sympathies and they missed their friends on the French Riviera. Sir Harry and Lady Oakes were among the few acquaintances they could tolerate in Nassau. And that was only because of Harry's millions. Sir Harry owned the golf course where the Duke, li Duke liked to play and the polo ground and ponies that the Windsors liked to watch. You can see in the center there, Harry Oakes on his left, the Duke, and above their heads, uh, just to the right, is um, the Duchess of Windsor. And rather bizarrely, uh, given that this is the Bahamas, Lady Oakes in a fur coat. <laughs> <laughs> However, like the rest of Nassau's white elite, the Windsors sneered at Sir Harry's rough manners and disheveled dress, and they deplored the way he simply ignored differences of class and race. But Harry's fortunes were sliding. His adored elder, eldest daughter, Nancy, had eloped two days after her 18th birthday with a fortune hunter nearly twice her age, a Mauritian playboy named Freddie de Marigny, whom Sir Harry despised. Meanwhile, Lady Oaks had fallen out of love with the Bahamas. All that sneering couldn't have helped and preferred to spend her time elsewhere. But most important, Lakeshore Mine was getting worked out, so the Oaks' dividends were dwindling. He and other mine owners in Kirkland Lake also had a bitter strike on their hands in the winter of 1941 to 1942. The miners struck for union recognition and the strike rapidly became a national confrontation between the federal government and the labor movement over the issue of collective bargaining. The owners successfully persuaded the province to call in the Ontario Provincial Police and defeat the strike. But the strike succeeded in unifying organized labor behind the demand for collective bargaining. It was one of the most important la labor disputes in Canadian labor history, and it proved a big hit on Lakeshore's dwindling earnings. And then, in July 1943, Sir Harry Oakes was mysteriously and brutally murdered. His friend Harold Christie, the real estate, real estate agent, who was now Oakes's business partner and best friend, found his battered, bloody bod body in his bedroom the morning after a wild tropical storm. Christie had stayed the previous night in Westbourne, Sir Harry's house. He claimed to have heard no unusual sounds in the night. The lengthy central section of my book covers the botched investigation of the crime, the very suspicious intervention of the Duke of Windsor, and the arrest and trial of the chief suspect, Freddie de Marigny. Reporters swarmed the Nassau courthouse, declaring this the trial of the century. Murder trials have a unique appeal to writers as well as to readers, and the Oakes trial was an international sensation. Remember, this was 1943. And on the other side of the Atlantic, the Second World War was grinding on. The murder and trial were, I'm afraid, welcome distractions. Even 80 years later, as I sat in the Nassau archives, reading the judge's notes on the, on the trial, I was gripped by the drama of it. How Freddie de Marigny got off the murder charge is a masterpiece of great legal work by his defense team. To this day, the crime remains unsolved, although in the book I make it pretty clear who I think did it or was responsible. The person who should have been the leading suspect in Oakes's death was never properly investigated, and there are reasons for that. But the corpse was not allowed to rest undisturbed. The story of Sir Harry Oakes became a kind of Rorschach test for writers who explored it. And this is the final section of my book, the way that the murder of Sir Harry Oakes has been distorted by subsequent explorations. In every successive telling, Oakes became an increasingly unattractive character. This was the first book about the case, Geoffrey Bocker's 1959 biography of Oakes. Bocker essentially demonized Sir Harry Oakes. He ended his book with a vindictive flourish that Oakes deserved to die. Quote, whoever it was who cut Harry Oakes down, one can say this, that Harry asked to be killed. Bocker, I discovered during research in the Beaverbrook papers in London's House of Lords archives, had his own agenda as he wrote his book. In order to please Lord Beaverbrook, his Fleet Street employer on the Daily Express, 
he deliberately di diverted suspicion away from anybody in the Bahamas. Instead, on the basis of no evidence that he, had, he, he um, quoted, he blamed a mysterious international financial syndicate. Later writers based their descriptions of Harry Oakes on Bocker's characterization of him, often lifting entire phrases from Bocker's book. They came up with theories involving the mafia, the royal family, illicit currency traders, and even pr practitioners of black magic. The story was spun to suit the preoccupations of the writer. As a biographer, I know how easy it is to shape reputations posthumously. The tools are subtle adjustments, sly cuts, colorful embellishments, exaggerations. Writers can reframe events and manipulate history to suit their own purposes. Speculation becomes fact, and false facts litter the Oaks narrative. The books and film treatments got more and more bizarre. So Harry Oakes was the kind of man for whom few people shed a tear today. A wealthy old white man who was cantankerous, resentful, and often unpleasant to others. He embodies white privilege. And yet some people did see a different side to him. The schemes he developed on his vast tracts of land in the Bahamas had provided employment for hundreds of black Bahamians who were otherwise on the brink of starvation. He had also established schools, a bus service, and a botanical garden. While in the Bahamas, I found a monument to him on which he was described as, quote, a great friend and benefactor of the Bahamas. Dame Doris Sands Johnson, the first black woman to run for political office in the Bahamas after independence, quotes in a memoir, Gossip Among Black Bahamians, that, quote, Sir Harry was killed because he was so generous and fair to Bahamian laborers and had vowed to bring about the downfall of one of the Bay Street boys. So who killed Sir Harry Oakes? I never found a smoking gun. So that part of the story has no emotionally satisfying resolution. It remains, in the words of Earl Stanley Gardner, the creator of Perry Mason, who was among those who covered the trial, quote, the greatest murder mystery of all time. But by writing a full biography, rather than focusing solely on the true crime episode, I was able to tell the forgotten story of Ontario's great gold rush. And I explained how Toronto became the financial capital of the mining industry. And I illustrated how, after death, nobody's reputation is safe. That's why historians have an obligation to expose facile, plausible, but finally false interpretations of false times, false lives. And to suggest to as large a readership as possible, first, that our country has an intriguing history, and second, it's a really good idea to consider an author's own agenda when assessing their work. Thank you. Thank you.